все давайте рассаживаться. И вот эти способы. Цитан. Дель Коллекс. Акула с этим трудом. Саша, вы кромеет спак, сэр, пожалуйста, кейк и стейк. Кромеет спак, сэр. Dear colleagues, we resume our work. You can see that our wise Inna, as she was compiling this program, she um, just put it along the lines of some simple themes. Today we are speaking about the global policy, how international relations, what we look at today. This is the thrust of today's presentation, and this is what puts it all together, not in white. Not, not, not just obviously, but um, even implicitly, even the G cows fit in. Now we continue to talk about international politics and policy. We should discuss it with our excellent German expert, and she will be now presented by Lena. Well, it is very difficult for me to introduce Zilke Tempo. Why? Because there's several very important international conferences that are attended. I suddenly realized the assumptions are actually addressed to you. I saw a fantastic a fantastic moderator and facilitator. Facilitators at such international conferences, they but they usually are split into several sections or sessions, each dedicated to some topic. And each session lasts about two hours. A panel of experts is invited, and they also invite a well known journalist who contact them. It could be anybody from BBC to CNN and others, and amongst others, I heard Zilke. Talk several times as she was invited to be a facilitator such sessions, which is considered to be a very honourable duty, and you have to be very high skilled to be recognised as such and to be invited as an expert of the level that is usually seen at any conferences in Brussels in the German Marshall Fund. And I was several times just amazed by it. I was amazed. And the very first time I heard her speak, the remarks that she makes and the way she is as a facilitator and how to connect her, she could be, how she could interrupt if I fly in it. But I ask him, can you please do hold a different opinion or do to the audience? And then approach her after one of those sessions, never expecting that I could be any success, could meet any successes, and what did you and I suggested, could you please travel uh, with some to Russia and make a presentation in Russia? And it turned out that she responded so, in such a friendly and amicable manner. And she's now so much absorbed into what this school does. She's now the member of our board of trustees and ad advisory board, and her names. Is very well known. She's teaching in the United States of America. She has met the Internet Journal, something like Foreign Affairs for Russia, for, sorry, for America and for Germany. And then she is a remarkable, remarkable speaker. But I would like to say that few people can get to talk about it in such an engaging manner, even for myself, although I'm a strong believer in what I do. The way she speaks about democracy is something really remarkable, but nowadays, because of the changing global world, she has no time to speak about democracy. Uh, so we suggested she should discuss a topic that is called, as you see it in your agenda. I'm very grateful to Zilke for traveling here. She attended this yesterday morning. 
we see major problems here in traveling to Russia. She traveled to be here with us a day and a half. And some of you have suggested to the audience, yes, she's very open, so you can always approach her and talk to her. She's very open for communication. So far, she does not speak Russian as yet, but through your talks, and I think we have had people who speak English, and secondly, you can invite our broadly your interpreters. I strongly suggest that you should speak to her. It's okay. I really am very grateful to you for being here with us. And uh, for us, it's a great honor that an expert of your level, of your level of professionalism, every year travels to seminars by the school. That's it. Easy enough for the floor. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here because it's every time I'm here, it's great fun, and I, I really intellectually and otherwise enjoy the discussion with you guys so much that I really would not like to miss it. Um, Lena, thank you, of course, for all the words of praise that you heaved upon me. I, I will dare you to repeat this to me word for word tonight, so that it makes me feel even more important. And, and, of course, this doesn't put me under any kind of pressure here, <laughs> but never mind. And then, thirdly, just to remark, of course, Lena did not approach me saying, would you please come to Moscow, because we really have this interesting NGO there, and we're doing this interesting work. Um, Lena looked at me and very determinedly said, you have to come to Moscow. And I didn't feel like you know, saying no at all, you know, you do not say no to Lena at all. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here, really. Um, when we were talking about what, what kind of topic I could talk about these days, um, I choose to do something that I'm basically doing all the time, dealing with international affairs and trying to make sense of the world. And, and what helped, had helped me greatly these days was that a couple of months ago, uh, our Foreign Minister Steinmeier started a process that he called or gave a very unsexy and very dull name um, that is Review 2014. Until the very day I have a problem um, spelling review really correctly. What he did was he basically, he basically asked 60 experts from all over the world and from Germany, Dmitry Trenin was among them, to answer two simple questions. What if at all, is wrong about German foreign policy, and what, if at all, has to be changed. And I thought, that's remarkable, really. I, I would not know too many foreign ministers who would so plainly invite to get you know, hit over the head, and to inv uh, who would so plainly and clearly invite um, criticism. And as the editor of a foreign policy magazine, I, of course, thought, well, if they do a review, then we do a review of the review. You know, we basically skim through all the papers and then we'll see what the world and what experts really expect from Germany that has a much more important role these days, that is asked to be much more um, substantial in its engagement in foreign policy, etc., etc. Now, when I set out to read these 60 papers, but actually in the beginning it was only 40 and then it became more, I have to admit some of the reading was quite a bit dull, some of it was very much political science stuff, um, some of it was really interesting and challenging, but one thing really struck me, um, I thought it was really extraordinary, that whenever all these experts tried to describe the world of today, they basically used the words, since the end of the Cold War, or they would describe it in the age of globalization, or as our Chancellor sometimes says it, she says, well, in the 21st century, like in the 21st century, we do not annex countries or part of other countries anymore. And I make you wonder, what, what kind of a description is this in the age of globalization or since the end of the Cold War or in the 21st century? In the 21st century is merely describing chronology, but not a proper analysis of the world we live in. Now, as a trained historian, I know, of course, that usually you only know from hindsight what kind of era, era we are living in, because it's much easier to describe things that are past than to describe the world we live in. Uh, as an editor, I'm, I'm obsessed with language and the position of language, and I'd really like 
to have ideas formulated as precise as can be just as why I'm so why I find political science jargon so awful because usually it's just empty words but never mind so why is it that we cannot find a proper description for 25 years that are passed since the fall of the Berlin Wall or since the breakdown of the Soviet Union why do we still have to describe it since the end of the Cold War and that's even more remarkable when I just look at you and I would say, well, I'm one of those elderly people who do have a recollection as to what the Cold War was like and how the GDR looked like before the, the Berlin Wall um, came down. But there are plenty of you in the room who probably would not have any conscious recollection of what the Soviet Union really was like. You basically know it from tales, from history books, from, people, from what people tell you about it, but you don't have any concrete sense. And still we cannot describe it. That's remarkable. And then, of course, I thought about in the beginning, in the 90s exactly, there were a few attempts to describe the world as it is. Um, some of the famous ones were, of course, Bob Kagan, who thought that America is from Mars and Europe is from Venus. And what he meant by this is that America is Martians, Martian in the sense that it would also use hard power, military power, while the Europeans are sort of these softy winkies uh, who are from Venus and would just yeah, put all their strength into soft power and would not like to recur so much to hard power. Um, there was, of course, Sam Huntington, who in a famous article in Foreign Affairs diagnosed a clash of civilizations to come where he identified, as far as I remember, seven different zones of different cultures that might clash eventually, most of all, the, the Islamic world with the other world. And then, of course, there was Frank Fukuyama and the end of history, which I think was misread a lot um, or misinterpreted a, a lot. Um, what he wanted to say was, with the end of the Cold War, we don't have an ideological competition anymore because there's no ideological competitor anymore to liberal democracy and market economy. Communism was dead by then. And with communism also, a once great promise of communism, namely the utterly just society, was dead with it. And I do not think that it can be resurrected in any form. Um, so there is no ideological contender and competitor anymore. And this is the world we live in. So the only ideological model or model of universal value, perhaps, that's left over after the breakdown of communism really is the liberal democracy and market economy. And when you look back into the 90s, we all seem to be very enthusiastic because, you know, the Eastern European and Central European countries became more democratic and there were so and so many think tanks who were counting the numbers of, of states that have become more democratic. And we all thought, Dmitry Trenin was speaking about this, that also Russia is on the way to democracy eventually. And if there was one country I can say exactly these days, that sort of mocked Frank Fukuyama for his overly enthusiastic um, um, diagnosis of the world today, we certainly believe um, in, in the kind of idea that eventually, eventually, almost every country will become a bit more like us, namely democratic and namely more peaceful, etc., etc., more engaged in international global trade than anything else. Obviously, and one can say this for the last years, um, this is wrong. Um, what we didn't want to see so much was not only did a new world develop in the sense of there were new powers coming or becoming powers to so-called emerging countries, uh, namely China, of course. With the rise of China, you know, the world change has, has changed quite a bit. Uh, there are so-called BRIC countries. Uh, there's Brazil, there's India, countries that really claim to wanting to have much more of a say in international politics and who have a lot of grievances about the West or mainly about the U.S. and who think that we should have a different world order than we had before. Now, when I look at these countries, I should... A bit louder, yes. I just moved the microphone a bit closer. Is that better for you? Okay. So, when we look at this, we can see the rise of new countries. But the amazing thing is, when we come to think in terms of ideological competitors, that all of these countries, in one sense or the other, have elements of Western ideas or Western elements in their political systems. 
I mean, Brazil so far has become a democratic country in the sense of they have democratic institutions. I would not say that this is a perfect democratic country in many senses. I think there are lots of things to do when it comes to social injustice, but the political system is originally a Western one, or one that has been originally thought up in, in Europe. India, which certainly in many senses when it comes to the culture, is a very unique, very specific, and in a sense not very Western country in the classic sense, but it has a more or less functioning democratic, well, it has functioning democratic institutions. Japan certainly is an Asian country, but for a long time it has democratic institutions. China's reforms by Deng Xiaoping that he started in 1979 made use of an idea that originated in Europe, namely capitalism. It's just that they combined it with a communist rule, which was a hybrid nobody thought to be possible a couple of years ago, but they've been doing this very successfully. And when I look at Russia, um, and we come to this a bit later, I would say, Oh, there's so many elements that are really visible. I just have to look around and look at all your gadgets and say, well, it's all Western technology. You know, Apple all over the place. And when I land in Chavagret New York Airport and I see all the nice cars in the parking deck, I would say, most of those, oh, should I become patriotic about this, are BMWs and Mercedes's, you know, but they're certainly not Russian made. And there's certainly elements of also Western political thought in. Um, in the, not perhaps in the Russian system, but in Russian political culture. So the question still remains, obviously, this is a much more multipolar world, as we call it. And the systems that we see are not as clearly distinguishable as they were during the Cold War. Democracies, Western style here, which was not really too back then because we've supported a lot of, of authoritarian regimes as long as they were not communist, of course. And then the communist regimes over there, which, you know, so were supporting some regimes, especially in the Arab world, which called themselves socialists but were really feudal. And they, but we don't have these blocks anymore. What we have is many more powers than before. And what we have is obviously political systems that are much more hybrid. You know, very different combinations with different elements uh, in it. And certainly the one thing that we can say is, and that's almost banal to say, the world has become more complex. It's not one side here and one side here. And it has also become a lot messier because there are many more interests involved. Um, um, there are many more different perspectives on how a, a global world order should look like. Uh, there are many more interests, as I said, so it has become more complex than this year. But are there also, you know, ideological challenges as to what liberal democracy and market economy is? And if you had asked me a couple of years ago, uh, with especially the Western countries in economic troubles and not looking very well, I would have said, well, I, I do certainly believe in democracy, but we do look pretty better than blues these days. So um, the model has become certainly not only a few, but quite a few scratches so far. But when I look at all these different containers, I say, where would be the ideological competition these days? And let's look really at the major forces. Is China really an ideological competition in any sense? I would say they are power and they probably become even more powerful. But is their model really a universal one? Is this a model that other countries could adopt? I do not think so. I think, and that's what the Chinese say themselves, our model is a model sui generis. We are unique. This cannot be transferred anywhere. Is it attractive? I'm not so very sure whether it's attractive. Um, this combination of capitalism and uh, authority and rule by one by, by just one party. Um, is it transferable? I don't think so. Does it have much soft power? I'm not so very sure about this. So it is a contender in the sense of it becoming even more powerful, but I don't believe that it's really a competition in, in many senses. The one interesting thing that would happen uh, that would make me more interested in the Chinese model would be, is it going from being a country that is basically and foremost copying you know, inventions by other countries to a country that can invent itself. That would be an interesting question. I'd be very curious to see. 
whether this is happening or not. Uh, one of the other contenders or competitors, really, because um, it thinks of itself as a, you know, a counter model to democratic West and the US and Europe, certainly is political Islam. But if you were listening closely to what um, he has been talking about this morning, the interesting thing is the most of the Bibi Islamic groups were absolutely fantastic when it came to um, organizing welfare organizations and institutions in their very region. I've seen this in Gaza, I've seen this in Egypt, I've seen this in other places. Those were reliable, they were efficient, they were functioning. But the minute they're a state power, the minute they're in government, uh, they basically reached the limits. And it was really interesting, if not tragic, to see that the Muslim Brotherhood, after so and so many years in opposition, when they were in power, and I've been speaking to many of them, did not have a clue as to what the economic policy should be, what they should do with minorities. They didn't have an idea as to what kind of rights the Copts in Egypt should have, how a society could be pluralistic, what, what the state or what government would have to deliver to their people, what security would mean in a society like this, and what rule of law means in a society that basically would be governed by religion. And the one thing that I love to ask uh, people you know, from the Muslim Brotherhood basically was, you know, if you're speaking about democracy, and all of them have been talking about democracy one, of, one way or the other, what do you do with religion? If you install God into the political system, how can you make sure that God can be voted out of office? End of discussion. So, I don't think that political Islam really is in any form something attractive beyond those who think it's sort of a counter, a counter uh, movement to, to Western modernity and something that's very genuine. Even if you look into Iran, that's been an Islamic republic for 30 years, They've basically used or also used elements of Western thought. I mean, the fascinating thing about Iran is that they have a parliament and they have, for the fact that it is an authoritarian regime, a quite pluralistic polit political landscape with real competition before elections. And they have a president that is, if, you know, they're hybrid in a way that on one side they have the religious political order. Uh, uh, and on the other side, they basically have a parliament and the president and a, a, a very worldly Western way of order. So obviously also they have to sort of borrow some of the ideas of Western modernity. And then of course, we could also um, come to, we also could come to Russia. Um, Dmitry Klinin just basically, I, I'm not so sure whether I quote him directly, but he said, well, it, especially with the crisis in the Ukraine and annexation of um, Crimea, um, Russia has made itself basically not into a challenge. I really, really wish that Russia would be a challenge in the same sense of a competitor, especially economically. Russia has made itself into a nuisance, which is a completely different, different thing. Um, can it offer a model that is really attractive? Um, does it have an economy that is producing things. And as I said, you know, I mean, when I get out of the airport and um, when I was being driven here, on one hand, I'm full of amazement over how much this country has changed over the last 25 years. But when I look at all the shops and the firms and the steel and glass buildings that I see on the way, almost none of them have any labels of Russian companies on them. It's all foreign companies. They produce here, nice, but what is it that Russia is producing? Not much. When, ha when have you last seen a label with, with the name Made in Russia on it? I haven't for a long time. Where is the productivity? Is it all about selling oil and gas in order to import everything that makes the life more comfortable? That cannot be it. And when uh, President Putin basically says, in the context of the Ukraine crisis, I'm here to defend Russians, and I, de I define Russians e as everybody who is Russian speaking, that makes the Russian model pretty much unattractive for everybody who's not a Russian speaker or not a Russian in this definition, and we have a lot of non-ethnically Russians in Russia itself. So what would be the model that is based on Russia, or that Russia is based on the political model, it would make it more universal, 
and more attractive for anybody out there. So do I think that Russia is a, an ideological competitor in any sense that it offers something attractive? I'm afraid not. I don't think this is so. And when we define the world like this, it made me think about how do we define power then these days? And of course, we have, and we will probably always have, the old ways of defining power by military might, by making others to respect you or even to fear you. But that's not everything. It cannot be everything. This is a very, very thin layer of power because you obviously need to have resources to build on the military power. And how do you get the military power? How do you get these resources? I would say by economic power. So obviously one of the new currencies of power is economic might. And how do you produce economic might? And I would say there have to be a few elements in there as to how you can produce economic might. First of all is you have to have rule of law because those who are entrepreneurs have to be sure that their rights are respected and that their property is respected and that when they sue somebody who doesn't pay their bills, they would, they would be supported by the, by, by, by the courts. So rule of law is one. The second one is a certain creativity. And how do you produce creativity? How do you, I mean, everybody is talking about know-how societies. But how can you produce a know-how society? And the one place where I really sort of started to understand what it means was when I was teaching at Stanford and I was in Silicon Valley for a couple of times. And I thought, oh, this is how it works. I mean, here you have a hub like a university, which is always good to have. But what's even more important is you have an environment that is really agreeable, that is nice to live in. And I can tell you, California is a nice place to, to live in. But what's much more important is these kids at the university are encouraged, encouraged to think differently to come up with crazy ideas, to be skeptical, not to buy stuff that their professors tell them, but the professors are asked to really support their own critical thinking. And when you come to think why Europe in the 17th and the 18th and in the 19th century was more successful than other political cultures who were much mightier than little dirty Europe back then was because it was the creation of critical thinking, because it was you know, the, the endurance of skepticism the simple questions, are things the way they tell me they are, or are they different? I think that's the single most element that you need in order to produce creativity. And if you don't have this, if you have schools where children are asked to basically repeat what the teacher says or what the TV plays out, then you're lost. You're not going to have a pool of really creative people who can be creative in all kinds of different fields. And a third, of course, is something that I referred to uh, earlier. This is what Joseph Nye has called the soft power. What's funny is, and I don't know whether you know, but there's so many think tanks right now, not only think tanks, but basically, um, or consulting firms who are being asked not only by firms and companies, but by countries to do something about their image abroad because they understand this is something, um, this is something important. And actually, if I was such a consultant, I would be sure that I wouldn't make any money because the one single most answer I would give, if you really want to do something about your image abroad, don't hire spin doctors for a hell of amount of money. Do things better at home. No. Be reliable. Be transparent. Have rule of law. That would help when it comes to image. So soft power and the attractiveness of the political, of the political system obviously is something that is very, very important. Now, so far, I have not been saying anything about the Western democracies, but I will now. Because, of course, it's not only authoritarian regimes that make mistakes or that have failures and flaws and even bigger flaws. But we see this in democracies as well. We see that in, our demo in a democracy like the United, United States, we have, we have a confrontation in the Congress that makes it almost impossible for the president to rule in many senses. We have worries in Western democracies whether our system of, of decision-making is too complex 
to really react sometimes as immediate as it is nece necessary. Um, we, of course, in the European Union have a problem of legitimacy, with people feeling that things are being decided in Brussels and the people in Europe cannot, cannot de uh, decide about it themselves. So what I'm saying is, also democracies are not without flaws. And this is not just to make an excuse of, you know, I mean, now I've been, la I've been lashing out against authoritarian regimes and now I say something not so nice about democracies. No, this is systematic in the sense that democracies are not built on perfection. They are built on the assumption that people are not perfect and that the system is not perfect. And the single most element in democracy that is needed, apart from rule of law, of course, is checks and balances or the understanding that constantly, where there is men at work, you have to correct errors. And when you transfer this into the realm of global politics, and when we assume that I am right when I'm saying the world is becoming much more messier than it's been before, or it's been for a long time, it's been pretty messy in the 19th century as well, then there's one single most necessity that we have to deal with, and that is correcting errors. And then I came to the conclusion this might not be a very sexy name, really, and this might sound complicated, but if I was to choose a name for the era we live in, then I would like to call it the era of the necessity to making corrections. <laughs> corrections, to correct ourselves, to correct errors. And I think if there is a competition between political systems, then it is the question, how much does my own system and the institutions of my system and the society I live in and the political culture I live in allow me to speak out openly, to name mistakes when I see them, how much do they allow dissent, how much do they further a public opinion that is really independent, how much do they give you the feeling that if 90% say the same thing, something must be wrong about it, you know, it cannot be correct, right? How much does it enhance skepticism? How much does it provide you security in the sense that if I go before court, I have a good chance you know, to get my right? And how much does it allow you critical thinking? And I guess those are the questions that you have to deal with. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to your questions.
so uh, we are moving to our uh, Q&A and discussions. Our talk has finally joined us. Uh, we were waiting for him uh, so long, and uh, I'm giving him the first uh, floor. I'm Anton Petrov from St. Petersburg. The question in English, I guess. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Temple. Uh, my question will be connected, actually, with the work of one of the uh, supporters of the school. It's uh, Christopher Coker. Uh, he has a book which is called, I guess in English, uh, Dawn of the West. In this book, he uh, shows in, to which extent, for example, Germany uh, was in opposition to the West in, for example, 19th century. And in fact, Germany has provided a lot of attractive um, alternatives uh, in culture, first of all, such as, for example, Hegel's works and uh, uh, Weber's works, and uh, even Mann was uh, telling a lot of um, uh, words that were uh, opposing to the liberal democratic regimes of the West at that time. But as we know, now G Germany is one of the columns of the West, and even though they have actually provided a lot of attractive opportunities uh, for the European culture as opposed to the West. Uh, so uh, Christopher Koch gives certain answer to this question why this happened. Uh, he says that there is some kind of a destiny of uh, European countries that they have only way to become liberal democracies, there is no other way. And this way started from the uh, French Revolution. Uh, and Russia is one of the countries which also has the same destiny. Uh, what would be your reaction to this, this question? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, just, just as a general um, um, confession here, I do not believe in historical destiny at all. Um, and I know that quite a few German thinkers and philosophers have been musing about the kind of destiny and also some others uh, as well, you know, historical determinism and so on and so on. But history is made by decisions and by wrong decisions and by right decisions sometimes um, um, and not by any form of destiny. And if we, if we, if we think about Germany's role, um, Germany certainly was one of the countries um, that really had, to say the least, a very complex relationship with modernity and the the, the promises of modernity which were made with the American Revolution, and I would like to name it, we tend to forget this, and the French Revolution in 1789, of course. And Thomas Mann, um, you reminded us correctly about this, uh, uh, um, basically also made this one difference that was valid so for so, such a long time in German society between a Kulturnation, a age of culture and a civilization. So Western, Western liberal democracies would be civilizations, they would not be authentic, they would not be rooted in a certain history. While Germany is rooted in this history. Now this hasn't much to do with uh, destiny, this had a lot to do with the repercussions of the Thirty Years' War and the fact that Germany did not have a political entity to speak of. But many German-speaking people, they would try to identify it. So there was basically a term to help Germans to identify with everybody German speaking, but not living in one entity, which France had, or Great Britain had for a long time, or England at least. And Germany was uh, also the one European country that came up uh, with the one system that was in many ways also the negative answer to modernity, and that of course is National Socialism. I do not think that it was very attractive. It was the single most destructive um, historical event and movement in Germany and, and I really, really believe that was the decision after 1949 was the establishment of the Federal Republic of Germany and then of course also of the Democratic Republic of Germany. The one strategic idea of Konrad Adenauer, namely West integration, was the most important and most useful historical and political decision made in Europe because it basically ended um, the, Aus the Germany from oscillating between somehow between East and West, but it made it rooted in a European political system, namely the European Union, where it is clearly a, a totally integrated part of. For the first time in her history, Germany is not the unruly nation in the center of Europe. 
But Germany is basically a saturated nation in the center of Europe. And that, I think, is a great achievement. Dear colleagues, uh, on my list there is Denis Borakov with his comment. He is our uh, graduate and uh, he is an international affairs uh, expert. It was good to, uh, you know, recall everything about Fukuyama and Huntington. So I have a critique. Um, I disagree with you completely that uh, Putin's model is not attractive. Why? I think it's really attractive for those many regimes and transitions. I will give you a few examples. I will give you an example of Turkey, which is a democracy, but many Turkish friends that I have are complaining about Erdogan's of return back. Then it's India with uh, the new government of Modi, and there was an uh, Indian um, uh, student here last, uh, at the last session, and he was complaining about that too. And also Thailand, Mexico, all those countries. I, I would say that what you said is a democratic delusion. You believe that people judge these models, but I think it's not the people that judge them. It's the dictators or political leaders that, you know, choose a model that will help them stay in power. And I will describe this model, uh, like, in a, few, uh, in a few words. It's charisma. It's uh, the promise of stability. It's nationalism. And it's an appeal to an erstwhile glory. Um, and I think that um, uh, Putin's model is very popular these days because it allows many dictators, you know, promote their interests using these specific um, topics that I've just mentioned. What would, what would be your response to this? I think we have to distinguish between two, two different things. What I said was, is the model per se an attractive model that can be uh, they can be imitated or trans transferred to another place. And I would say, no, there's nothing in Putin's model, apart from the classical elements of an authoritarian regime, that can be transferred. And actually, authoritarian regimes don't have to be transferred. You know? <laughs> Unfortunately enough, they build themselves very often. I mean, Turkey is a good example, while you're mentioning it. Um, Turkey has started as a certainly not flawless democracy. Turkey was in the beginning years of Erdogan, more democratized because what he tried to do was to integrate groups that were not part of the secular elite. And we thought that was a good thing to do because democracies uh, ought to be sex uh, in inclusive. Um, but he's now turning it into an authoritarian regime with all the classic elements in it uh, that is, you know, uh, censorship on media. Um, 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 hand, uh, um, um, brutality against demonstrations. Um, now, so and so many people from the judiciary and, and, and the police have been arrested. I don't think that Erdogan really needs Putin. What, what you mean is that Putin certainly um, reflects some kind of a sympathy in the sense of it's about time somebody confronts the West. But that doesn't have anything to do with the attractiveness of the model. Because the, the, the model of Russia, especially when it's based on we are here to protect Russians wherever they are, cannot be attractive to anybody who's not Russian. It's very focused in a sense, right? Well, Erdogan, Erdogan does not say he protects the Turks. I mean, he says basically he asks them to vote when he goes to Turkey, but I don't think that he would ever get the idea that he should sort of annex Kreuzberg. Um, to a, which is a part of a Turkish neighborhood um, to Turkey. I don't think that he's going that far, and I don't think that it, I do believe that this would be a very futile undertaking. What I'm saying is, it might be that some people might get ideas, and I think this is so. This is this makes it so important. Um, this makes the way we respond to what we've seen by Putin and, and over the last couple of months. So very important. Are we going to accept this or not? Do we, will we have a clever, smart answer to this or not? But I still don't. I still think that you might get a few friends for a limited period of time. But look, I mean, if you mention Mexico, Mexico is basically asking whether it can be part of TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership that the Europeans and the Americans are just now negotiating. It's because certainly Mexico would not like to be part of the economic realm of Russia. Not even Kazakhstan did like the idea of being part of the Eurasian Union, and not even Belarus likes the idea, much less Ukraine. Ukraine didn't like it at all. 
This is why they were for the EU association agreement, because they did not want to let this, sit, this option pass, where finally they could get on the path of development like Poland. See, when you talk to Ukrainians, and I think there are Ukrainians among us, so they could better speak for themselves, but my impression was that many of them basically said, look, I mean, what we, we just have to, we, we had basically the several, same level of economic development like Poland in 1990, 1991. Now, Poland's growth has been so much more sustainable, and Poland has been so much more successful. Why is it that we are not there? And that's a very legitimate question. And they saw part of the association agreement as a way to get out of this, the kind of corruption, the kind of charisma, the kind of, you know, authoritarian rule that you're describing. It might be attractive for a limited period of time, just like uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was attractive to Hugo Chavez of Venezuela and a few other people who are not very attractive to their own people after a while. But I don't think it's very sustainable in the long run. And the problem about charisma, let me, let me add a, a thing about this. What I really like about democracies and what sometimes seems to be their weakness is that basically they are uncharismatic. <laughs> it's a very down-to-earth, uncharismatic um, um, political system. And if you would ask me to name one of the most uncharismatic, I mean, actually deliberately uncharismatic leaders in the Western world, I would name Angela Merkel. She makes, she makes a business about being uncharismatic and not being a charismatic, macho guy like Gerhard Schroeder was. And this is actually what I like about her, because the point about democratic systems is... Everyone has to be replaceable. Everyone. So if you have democratic great leaders, sometimes things go a bit more smoothly, and sometimes they go a bit better. The one flaw about dictatorships is they build on the charisma of one person. Now, when this one person is, is for some reason, you know, not in place anymore, what do you do then? Each and every dictatorship I've seen has had problems of succession, each and every one. Now, democratic regimes sometimes, I mean, Tom Friedman put it really nicely when he said, uh, the American political system was thought up by geniuses, so it can be run by idiots as well. And I think he's right. The point is, can we have successions, and many successions, without turmoil? Because this is exactly what we need. And this is why we think, why I think, in the long run, the charismatic model might be attractive to some, and they're even attractive to some in Europe. I mean, the Pen's uh, far-right movement and some others, but they're not very attractive in the long run. That's a great start of the discussion, and uh, uh, I understand that um, uh, some uh, people uh, took uh, uh, your um, assumptions literally and uh, put them under criticism. Let's move on. Well, uh, uh, you are from uh, Pskov, but you uh, carry a very strange uh, T-shirt. I'm Alexei Simona from Pskov. Uh, thank you very much, Dr., for your um, presentation. And here comes my question. Well, uh, while talking, uh, you used uh, the term of soft power uh, quite frequently. In Russia, it's also quite a popular political term, uh, and uh, the uh, presidential administration and the foreign ministry and some other institutions uh, have been using that term, uh, I'm afraid, in a wrong uh, meaning. Uh, so, to the best of my knowledge, uh, that term of uh, soft power is more typical of uh, English-speaking discourse. Uh, while uh, in Germany they um, uh, use the term of smart force. So, could you explain if uh, the, the terms are the same or they have some difference? Difference, and if so, what is the difference? Uh, well, the, the one, the one who brought up um, the term of smart power was actually Hillary Clinton, um, and I thought, well. We do a whole lot of declination of what power is. We have hard power, we have soft power, now we have smart power. Um, 
In Germany, because this was the question you asked me, in Germany we basically use pretty much the word soft power in the English term. Uh, we don't even use a German translation for this. Um, and what we mean is, is, is basically really the attractiveness of a certain model that could create trust and that would make some of the dealings um, easier. Now, soft power would have been, just to name one example for Germany, um, when the Euro crisis began, and, the, the, um, and, and, and mainly Angela Merkel and some others made Greece really um, to follow a very strict, um, a very strict program um, of, of cutting down on, on expenses for bureaucracy, etc., etc., austerity measures. Uh, Merkel was funny about it because he said, "Well, I've never heard before the word austerity, but now here it is." Um, it would have been great if she had travelled to Greece just to say, uh, listen everyone, I know this will be very, very hard for you and I would really like to make an attempt to explain to you why I think those are the right measures and why I think at the end it will be successful. She didn't, she did it far too late. That would have been a perfect example of soft power, I assume. And this is exactly uh, what I'm talking about. Um, don't mistake me, however, I do not think that soft power alone is enough for a world that is confusing, that is complex, uh, that, is, that is very, very um, messy, and where other people do use a lot of hard power. So if there is one mistake in Europe so far, then I think that we are not really aware of what hard power would, should mean to us. But soft and, and, and just to make a difference between smart power, I'm not so very sure whether Hillary Clinton every, really ever defined what exactly she meant by smart power. But as somebody who is dealing with international relations a lot, uh, I would say smart power is when you are acting in a way um, that leaves as many as possible different options open to you. Just to give you an example, I, there was one there was one part in Dimitri's speech where I do disagree with him. I do not see that um, European media is vilifying Putin as Hitler. I mean, there were comparisons with Hitler, and then there was a huge discussion in Germany, can we compare him to Hitler, isn't that stupid, blah, blah, blah. So there's so much vilifying, but from what I can see, um, from the little that I see on, on English, uh, Russian media is that in a situation where all of the separatists in Ukraine are constantly hailed as um, the great heroes, and where the Ukrainian government is constantly vilified as the fascists, this is not only factually not right, this closes basically the options that you have, because you basically train a general public to see the world like you do. Now, there is no chance for you to sort of change course when it's necessary. When one day it would be more necessary, for example, to say, we cannot go on under supporting the separatists in Ukraine because there is a backlash. Like there is a backlash after the downing of the Malaysian airplane. And there is a huge backlash. I can tell you, Putin basically has lost Germany with the downing of, of, of this flight. Um, now, what do you do? And this is, this is what I would define as smart power. See to it that even in a complex, very messy world, um, you have quite a few range of options open that you can choose from to follow the goal that you define at the end. And if you sort of make your path really very small, I would say that's dumb power then. Question from a Polish person. Can you take it closer to the mic, please? Uh, I want to ask about uh, post politic and about is it, uh, how do you see this after a few years? Do you see it as, as a kind of success? And do you feel like Germany should, should follow this very, this rather soft way of treating Russia? Thank you for this um, really important question. With mentioned West integration as one very, very important strategic decision for West Germany. And I think the almost natural um, um, complementary step was us politic. Um, because it really, what it meant at the time, the way I understand it in hindsight was, 
here we are. The status quo is not going to change anytime soon. Um, and we have to not confront them, but also to engage them in order to make it also easier for people, you know, especially in East and West Germany, um, to see each other, or at least West Germans to see families in, in East Germany. And the slogan of Ostpolitik at the time, of course, was Wandel durch Anlehrung, change through rapprochement, they would call this. And then it became a bit more change through trade, um, something that sort of left out that Ostpolitik was also meant to support the civil rights movement in the Eastern Bloc and to sort of really bring a slow change of this political system about. This part, so sort of the humanitarian part was largely forgotten after a while. And then um, over the last years, it was amazing how Ostpolitik was recycled and it became Ostpolitik 2.0 in a sense. Uh, it was not called Wandel durch Annäherung or Wandel durch Handel anymore, you know, change through trade, but Wandel durch Annäherung, change through Rapprochement. And the idea was, as I said, you know, as we were the true believers in Frank Fukuyama, really, the idea was that eventually, in the age of globalization, here we are again, um, with further integration through economic means, you know, uh, basically not so democratic regimes would change after a while because there would be a middle class and the middle class would after a while also ask for political rights and they would sort of ask for reforms, they would ask for change. What we have not been prepared for, and I'm speaking for Germany now, is um, that some, some, for somebody who would basically say, oh, that's a fine concept, you know, do you change to rapprochement, you know, do it until you're blue in the face. But I do have different ideas. <laughs> I have different interests, and actually one of the interests I have is to have Crimea, and not, and not to have Ukraine be part of, of uh, the European Union, because um, um, I had designed Ukraine for the Eurasian Union, and you're getting into my sphere of influence and interests. So I do believe that Ostpolitik was a very good concept, and it still could be. But what we learn right now is the limits of a, a, a politics of a possible, because obviously at a certain time or it's, you know, at certain points, there are events that are not acceptable. Dimitri has been speaking about the, the, the case of Syria. I was appalled when Obama first set red lines, and then the red lines were crossed, and he did exactly nothing. And that's encouraging basically for people who set out to cross red lines anyway. Now you could of course think about how useful is it to define red lines in the first place if you don't want to keep them. Are you really ready to, it's like in education, you know, if you say you go to bed now or else, you better think hard about what or else is and whether you want to really do it. So you either don't define any red lines at all or if you define them, you better stick to them. What I'm saying to that is there are limits to rapprochements, and there are times, unfortunately, where one has to draw red lines and try to keep them because something is happening that is not acceptable to others, which does not mean, by the way, um, that there should not be room for talks and negotiations at, at the same time. I mean, gosh, we are not in a girls' boarding school where uh, international politics is not about, and now I'm not talking to you anymore. I mean, you have to. But there are limits of understanding, and I'm afraid when Angela Merkel says so-and-so lives in a different world, she might be right, and there are limits of understanding. And then Ostpolitik is not a very valid, um, um, obviously not a very valid concept anymore, but one that should be reinstalled as soon as there is a common base of talks and as soon as we can negotiate on a few basic things. Uh, colleagues, um, I'm, I'm interested to, in involving as many of you in the discussion as uh, possible. So we have some activists uh, who appear to be particularly interested in asking questions, which is of course good, but I would certainly be uh, interested in your, uh, in your wider engagement. Yes, please, now, from Ivan, yes. 
Thank you. Ivan Palazzo from, uh, from uh, Königsberg. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our speaker, Mr. Trenin, you mentioned, uh, was asked who can be the perfect mediator in talks between Russia and Ukraine now? And his, and his answer was yes, it's Germany. But Germany won't do that because they're not ready for the role of European political leader and potential competitor for the United States. Do you subscribe to this point of view and why? Thank you. Or why not? <laughs> um, Germany already is um, trying to keep the line open with Vladimir Putin. The one leader in Europe and actually in the Western world who is on the phone most with Vladimir Putin is Angela Merkel. And that's not only because Angela Merkel speaks some decent Russian and they might converse in Russian every once in a while, which sometimes helps in the mutual understanding. When it comes, well, l let me first say where I disagree. Um, I do disagree on the notion of Germany assuming a specific role where it could become, what was the exact ex expression anymore, where Germany could become sort of a, uh, a, a supplement for the United States? I doubt that uh, now Germany is economic leader for the, the European Union, and in that case, it, it, it will become the political leader and competitor for the United States. Competitor, competitor. Is right. um, I'm not so very sure whether Germany should become a competitor of the United States, and I do see not. I do not see the need to become a competitor um, because this is not. We are not in a situation where Europe or Germany would be struggling over, you know, spheres of influence or anything, or having more of a say in certain things. Uh, but this is about a, a critical dialogue within the so-called Western world, or let's say between Europe and the U.S. or Germany and the U.S. specifically. We have a lot of grievances about the U.S. right now. Um, but we also have a lot of agreements with the U.S. So I, I would not... I would not really like, um, I would not at all like Germany become uh, a competitor to the US. I like it to be a country that assumes a more responsible role, uh, that becomes, uh, that is less shy about foreign policy than it has been for many years because of the Cold War situation. Um, indeed, it has to relearn the role uh, in many ways. And I can see that in the discussions in Berlin that we are not yet really used to this role. Um, I do think it assumes responsibility in, in, um, in, in the Ukraine crisis. Uh, as I said, it keeps the lines open with uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, it can only be thought when it comes to foreign policy in the context of Europe. Of course, Germany can formulate certain ideas. It can push certain ideas. It can see to it that it finds certain groups of countries that would be engaged in certain fields for the Southern Partnership in North Africa, for the Eastern Partnership in Eastern Europe. But it will not, I cannot go it alone because this is not what Europe allows and this is not what the EU was, was made for. It has to find partners and when uh, Merkel in the beginning of the Ukraine crisis said if there ever will be sanctions then they have to be agreed by from Riga to Lisbon. And this is a very important statement because we know that Riga wants to see a tougher line. Um, but we are not so sure about Portugal because Portugal has to come out of an economic decision, but they have to be on board eventually. There can be one leading nation, and it would be very natural if it would be Germany these days, um, but it has to act you know, in a framework and that's the European Union. Mediating about the Ukraine with Russia. I don't think it's about mediating and who's doing, who's being the mediator. This is about a willingness to agree on certain fundamentals. And the first fundamental would be, does Ukraine have the right to decide which association or which, I do really don't like the word camp, but which you know, kind of institution or organization wants to belong to? I would say naturally less. Everything else would be a mockery of the self-determination of people. And from what I can see, 
this crisis has been the single most unifying or nation-building event in Ukraine. If they weren't sure whether they were really Ukrainians or something else, now they are, in a, you know, in a, in a huge extent. What does mediating over Ukraine mean and the fundamentals we have to agree? The fundamentals we have to agree is it cannot be that a country sends in military equipment into another country in order to support a separatist movement. If there's a separatist movement, then we have to see to it that this is expressing its will by civil, by civil means and not by military means. And if you look at the separatists who are there, how many of them are Ukrainian, really? And how many of them are Russian? So this is the basics we have to agree. There is no, you know, there is no balance of everybody is a bit right. There have to be a few basics that we can agree on before there is mediating. And then the mediating cannot be over Ukraine. I do not see any situation where there is a mediating over Ukraine without the Ukrainians. Now, if the Ukraine... They are the main force in this. This is about their country, isn't it? So if they are on board and if they are on board big, and if there is a government who is willing to negotiate with them, and if they agree to it, it's fine, and then they can ask for mediator. But if that condition is not fulfilled, I don't see anybody that doesn't have any, any that doesn't have so much to do with Germany taking upon itself the willingness to mediate. This has to do with the situation on the ground, really, in my view, at least. Так, ну хорошо. Да, да, коллеги напротив меня. Yes, please. Uh, colleagues, you may you may ask uh, questions in uh, Russian. Mr. Valtuk uh, from from uh, Khabarovsk, you have said that the world is uh, more complex today and it's more difficult to, to to describe. Before 1989, the bipolar world was more predictable, um, and uh, the it happens uh, that this world uh, before. Uh, 1989, while it might have been uh, approaching uh, the brink of a crisis, there was there was a very high threat, uh, and the cost of a mistake was extremely high. Today, um, it appears that the world is more diverse, and uh, do you believe that this diversity is in any way? Um, uh, that uh, because of this uh, uh, diversity, there is less danger of a, of a global um, conflict, uh, nuclear conflict, uh, uh, and how difficult or how more difficult it is to contain propagate proliferation of the nuclear weapons. Proliferation of nuclear weapons, of course, is important. This is this is what we this is why we are so engaged, and this is an example of European foreign policy when it comes to Iran, because. Really, we all have an interest in not having more proliferation of nuclear weapons. But if you look, see, it, it, it is a matter of how we judge things. Um, first of all, um, the world of the Cold War, of course, was dangerous in the way uh, that we thought there could be a nuclear Armageddon somewhere. You know, if, if people are irrational, there could be a nuclear war and that's the end of the world. And so a whole generation grew up with this and that of course was difficult. But then there was a certain rationality in it as well. Um, yeah, the whole system of deterrence in the Cold War functioned because we've had ra rational action actors so far who said, we're not going to the brink. This is mad in a way, but we're not going to the brink. We're not the self-destructors. When we judge how safe or secure is the world in the sense of how many people really die in conflicts, um, this has not become any better, really. And the point is, most people who die in conflict certainly did not die in any kind of full war ever since World War II. They died in so-called small wars. And they died by, not by the big weapons, really, but the single most deadly weapon in the world is the AK-47, because it's the one that is most pervasive in the world. Now, that's, that's the one, that's really a weapon of mass destruction. 
in a way, because it's used in so in so many conflicts. Of course, I could name a few others, but this is the one that is is, is most proliferated in a sense. And if you look at Syria and, and the, the, the the issue about weapons of mass destruction was brought up today. This is not a war where it is about you know uh, the use of weapons of mass destruction in the sense of chemical weapons. Um, there were a few hundred people killed by this, which is really outrageous. I mean, using these weapons is outrageous. But the really sad thing about these conflicts is the most of the death, the deaths, the, you know, or the, the tragedy in Syria is not due to any kind of, of, of really weapon of mass destruction, but to barrel bombs. By, by the Syrian army. I mean, they fill, they fill barrels with dynamite and they just throw it into, into um, civil neighborhoods. And, and it is due to the, to the smaller weapons that, um, you know, the, the, uh, t terrorist groups like ISIS and other, others carry in order to fight this Golan. So this is what I mean by the world has become more diverse in, in many senses and <laughs> Diversity in this, in this, in this civil sense is something that is wonderful. Uh, but uh, what I was discovering when it comes to security and stuff is uh, we've, seen, we've seen so many smaller wars with thousands of people killed and thousands of people displaced. You know, one of the places that we don't even think about anymore is Congo, where thousands of people get killed and there's the whole cities of refugees. So. What I mean by that is, you know, that's exactly what I meant by, by Messia. We don't have a time anymore. This is not a period of time where we might expect World War III, but we have many, many places of conflict with many, many victims all over the world. And since these are asymmetric warfares, um, we do not have all too many means to really stop this. It's a very complicated way to stop asymmetric conflict, uh, conflicts. Very complicated because it's not about defeating the other party. It's about sort of getting it into a political process as well. And gosh, this is darn, darn difficult. More production, colleague. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen more minutes. Timur Rajakov from Ingushetia. Uh, if I may tell a story, several years ago I was in Germany, and this was uh, uh, during um, the uh, famous events when a young couple uh, tried uh, to um, uphold their case for marriage. Um, uh, there were a brother and sister, uh, an incestuous couple, uh, two kids were sick, two kids were healthy. There was a long uh, legal story, but when I was there, the Supreme Court of Germany was um, uh, ruling out, uh, to, which was to uh, um, uh, decline their petition for marriage, uh, which was um, primarily due to the fact that the German constitution and the German legal framework is based uh, on the Christian precepts. Uh, you have been very critical about, uh, about uh, the political uh, Islam. And the political Islam, as far as I know, as far as I am aware of it, is not a model of a theocratic state. It is more of a combination of um, a democratic, uh, democratic principles and uh, religious uh, principles. And uh, the example of uh, Egypt is not particularly happy because, uh, because of some uh, uh, sporadic uh, events. Uh, the people who came to the helm of power uh, were unprepared people, um, uh, um, unprepared for governance of such a um, major country. Whereas uh, Turkey would be a lot more a successful example when uh, for several decades, and this is something that you have mentioned, where the so-called political Islam uh, was being um, um, forwarded, including the uh, past elections when uh, Mr. Erdogan could, um, uh, could uh, uh, gain a victory over his, uh, his political adversaries. Well, so far, 
with the possible exception of Tunisia, Tunisia uh, where the uh, Islamist party is also in the government. I have not really seen a model where uh, an Islamist party really, and I come to Turkey in a minute, really could fulfill the requirements of democracy to the full. And we have to see about Tunisia. And the requirements of, of, of democracy would say, uh, and I'm saying this is an ideal, I'm not saying that this is achieved right away, would be a promise of equality of people regardless of their race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and you name it. So far, I have not seen any kind of thinking in the political, in the world of political Islam where it would become clear that these requirements are fulfilled, right? Turkey is a very specific case, and for a while, I really had been thinking that, yes, they have figured out how to do this. I mean, there is, with the AKP, there is a party that really manages to be inclusive. And I think it was necessary that after decades, where the Turkish democracy was defined by a secular elite, and actually people who would wear, or women who would wear a headscarf, were banned from, from um, attending universities. I thought this is non-democratic. This is the real flaw. I think people should choose for themselves what they want to wear on their heads. And if it's three meter high ha hats, you know, then do what you want. Um, that Erdogan was inclusive in the way that he made it possible for a more conservative part of Turkey to become also an elite, you know, to sort of participate much more in the political system. What we see now is very frustrating, really. And I, I had once um, had the pleasure to moderate or to, to interview uh, Erdogan in a, in a session at the German Council on Foreign Affairs where I work. What we see now is very, it's not very encouraging. What we see now is changes in the Constitution. What we see now is the arresting of, of um, judges. What we see now is the oppression of independent media. What we see now is the undermining of democracy. And with that, a real chance to see an Islamic party, a political Islamic party in power that would not make the mistake to sort of think that their way is the only way, or the only way to pursue. What I, what I was talking about when I was so critical about political Islam is the question, did they really think hard about what they can deliver, what a government and a state has to deliver to its citizens? And I was surprised. I, I, I was sure that, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood was founded, established in the 1920s. They had seven decades to think about what would be our economic policy if one day we would come into power. What do we think does a state have to do? What will be the rights of our citizens? What will be the place of religion in our government? And they were totally helpless when it came to this. And they're not the only one. Hamas in the Gaza Strip did not deliver anything to the population over the last eight years. And I've been there several times. You know, even without the war, nothing. And that's, that's really sad. So what I'm saying is what they lack is a clear idea about what makes the state efficient. As I said, they were very, very efficient and, and remarkably and admirably so when it came to running, building and running welfare institutions. But on a, on a, on a larger extent, on, on, on the level of governance, so far, what I've seen is failure. And that's sad, really, more than anything else. Um, there is no, see, much of the thought in political Islam was, was um, basically only focused on moral laws within society, the role of women, etc. I mean, my God, you know, I mean, there are bigger things to think about. But one of the things that they have to think about is, well, what do we do with the concept of equality of human beings? And any political order that does not write it into their constitution and makes a serious attempt to reach this idea is not a democracy for, for me. You can call it whatever you want to, but don't call it democracy because it isn't one. I cannot call a laptop a piece of wood or a piece of wood a laptop if it isn't one. So there's not talk about democracy, but the kind of thinking about what does pluralism mean in a society where they're not only Muslims. Are non-Muslims entitled to the same rights? 
It's not that there's a final conclusion on this. I'm just surprised that there has been so little thinking on these issues. The Ukraine question from the Ukraine. Um, and the theoretical question about political language, you said it's, it's not maybe enough now, so maybe how could we make this language more clear and more understandable also in the context of uh, maybe understanding by different cultures and also in context of non-relative truth? Ah, this <laughs> My God, could you choose a less complicated question? <laughs> I mean, it's late in the afternoon, everybody is hot and tired. Um, really, this would be such a great task, and, and th this is what I meant by, by predictive thinking. You know, um, time and again to figure out whether what I hear and what I see uh, are really the facts. Um, perhaps this helps. Hannah Arendt traveled to Germany a couple of years after the end of the Second World War. And she wrote an essay for commentary, which was called um, Journey to Germany, something like that, very, very plain. And she made quite a few really interesting observations. Um, for example, that Germans blamed about everyone for the Second World War but themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, Second of all, there's no doubt Germany brought this about um, all of Europe. I mean, Germany invaded them, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and not, any, not the other way around. And what she figured was there is this kind of disease which she called mistake, mistaking facts, opinions for facts. And I think this is a very widespread disease. And I think this is, as a journalist at least, this is something that I really have to get myself to do time and again to really ask, well, in this case, what really are the facts and what are the opinions and how can I distinguish between the two in the most precise way? I'm not saying that this is ever to be reached. I mean, this is the great thing about relative truths that we've introduced with modernity instead of absolute truths, which are a matter of religion and, and stuff, or ideologies. Ideologies also tend to have absolute truths is that you have to do the darn tedious work to time and again try to distinguish between what are the facts on the ground, is what I see really what's happening, especially in, in the times of media that tempts us with pictures and with images, uh, which are very often much less reliable than we tend to believe because they can be manipulated or whatever, but we are all visual people, we, we tend to believe images more than we believe words. Um, but still, our job as journalists, as intellectuals, still is, you know, what is, is it that really happened and what is the opinion about it? Uh, Dragon will ask the last question of uh, the session. The colleague journalist, I would ask you, What's your comment about the propaganda war that's going on uh, in any wars, might, we might say, but the situation with Russia and Ukraine and the situation that we have in Western media where uh, sort of we do not see the other side or the atrocities, of course, that are happening on, on both sides. And, you know, if, if you are here for a couple of days, you might be amazed what kind of filter or things or information you do not hear uh, uh, outside of Russia. And do you think that this kind of uh, antagonizing, not just Vladimir Putin as a person, but Russia as a state, and we know how much important in this society state uh, uh, and, you know, symbolism is, uh, can, can cause anti-Western uh, uh, sentiments within the Russian society, and who is going to, to deal with that in the future? Well, as to your last remark, I'm afraid that we all have to deal with this in the future. Um, there's one thing that I've been observing for a long time, even before these uh, conflicts around Ukraine, and you can see it in other contexts as well, especially the Middle East, um, um, is, is the kind of, uh, of, of PR um, campaigning 
that is taking place. And what I'm worried about is, I have to make, I'm, I'm uh, not an obsessive, but I'm of course a user of Facebook, and I have a Twitter account, and I like to look into my, into these accounts and to see what is it that people are posting. But what, what is happening is something that is totally contra contradicting in a way what we've just said, that is social media make it a lot easier for us to choose the people we want to listen from or to listen to and to ban those people who might have opinions or who might also sometimes post facts that are uh, inconvenient for us that we do not want to register as much. Um, and what I also see is a tendency in general in the media of emotionalizing and dramatizing rather than reporting the facts. I mean, for a long time this has been going on, also in quality media, that there's, not, there's no clear distinction anymore between an op-ed and an opinion piece and just a, a, a dry report about, you know, the, the classical where, when, what, who, and so on. Um, this, of course, in this context, this has a totally different dimension. Um, and, and as I said, I do not understand the Russian media, but I do get some translations sometimes. Um, and uh, I have never seen a campaign as, uh, well, what is that? as almost, you know, airtight as this one, where almost nothing that would be a contradictory view is, is led through. And, and really, when I look into the Western media, um, some of it gets me up the walls as well. Um, as I said, I do not see the kind of vilifying of, of Putin. I've been checking you know, most of the covers for the last three years of The Economist. I didn't see the hell cover anymore. Probably Dimitri did mistake it for a cover by Time magazine. Um, I do not see the vilifying. I do see, um, over the last months, I do see an attempt to understand what's going on and to send people there, you know, to report from the place uh, in a way that we can understand it somehow. Um, some of it might be biased one way or the other, um, but I do see the attempt to sort of get a clearer picture of what is, is happening. Um, the general mood, I can tell you, uh, has been changing, not over the reporting. Um, the general mood in Germany has been changing over the doubting of the flight. I'm not, it was not just the downing of the flight of the Malaysian air, airplane. Um, when people saw on TV um, armed people rampaging through the fields and not letting experts in and even stealing wedding rings from some of, of, of the victims, that was it. This is when, when, I have to say, this is when Putin lost them. And this is when a, a, a bigger majority really came out and said, well, now we are for sanctions. This is, I mean, we cannot support anything of that sort. You know, even if we assume that this was an accident, even if we assume that we don't really know yet who's done it, but the ones responsible in the region you know, have to be made responsible for what they've done over four days while, you know, family and relatives were, were basically had to look on in, in, in the Netherlands. So what I see now is a media war um, that is really... Amazing, and are only taking place when it comes to Ukraine or other places. But I can follow it. I can follow it on the Gaza-Israel uh, conflict as well. You know, with each side trying to get out their message, uh, and, and 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 people getting very very emotional about this. And I know how difficult it is to sort of de-emotionalize as an observer because you do feel sorry for the victims. Of course, you do feel sorry for civilian casualties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm afraid this is what we have to do every once in a while, to let you know, common sense uh, prevail over what we see. And, and to, this is why I was saying, if we get just one picture, and this also gets me up when I, whenever I feel that you know, in the German media or in the English media that I follow, um, there is sort of biased reporting. The general question always is, do I at least in tiny bits, even if it's not the majority of media, but do I at least get some kind of a picture that it's different than the mainstream? Do I get some other ideas about what, what is happening, another take on what's happening? When I only get the same story all over, there's good reason to believe that most of it is propaganda. And I, and I think it's going to be difficult, not only because um, people are getting so emotionalized and, and actually really also manipulated over this, 
What really makes things so, so difficult is that there is no leader, even in authoritarian regimes, who would not count public opinion into um, the picture uh, in, in some way or the other. And this is why I said smart power would be to leave a bit more options open. Now, if, as a leader, you basically were hammering it into people that the picture is clear, what we see in Kiev is fascists and anti-Semites and Bandera bandits and so on and so on. And what we see in Ukraine is a legitimate fight for independence and for belonging to Russia. And there is no room, no space for any kind of dissenting picture. You are basically limiting your, your own space of actions because, as I said, politics so and so often is about the need to make certain turns because something happens, something unexpected. And you have to react to this. Now, do you have the space to do this? Let's just assume that for some reason, President Putin tomorrow would have to cancel his support for the armed forces in Eastern Ukraine. How does he explain this to his general public? Sorry, made a mistake. Sorry, the stories I put out were wrong. Well, sorry, it's a bit more difficult than or and complex than I made you believe. It limits the space of your political action, and that makes it so difficult and so dangerous. Because at one point or the other, you know, the, when the genie is out of the bottle, you don't get it back into this. You know, you're basically it's the genie who haunts you instead of you ordering the genie what to do. Dear colleagues, uh, uh, the presentations of our foreign experts uh, do help us uh, to take a side glance at ourselves, because when you're in uh, some, uh, uh, in uh, some, you're immersed in a certain environment, uh, it seems uh, that you can only see the world in, uh, uh, in um, uh, a particular way. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can get stimulated, and stimulus we do need for uh, for us as uh, humans uh, who uh, pretend that they uh, think uh, critically. Uh, we are very thankful uh, to our experts, uh, and what I have just said does not mean in the least that you have to agree with uh, everything that uh, Silke Temple has said. Um, uh, our uh, speaker has said uh, from the very beginning that... Uh, um, uh, a thinking uh, human uh, has the right uh, for doubts. Yeah, and uh, our organization uh, territory is the democratic society, so we have to thank Mrs. Temple for her contribution. Let me thank you um, for your questions, and as I said, I really do appreciate being challenged by your question because it makes me think harder, and it makes me think whether I'm right or not, and I, I really, I really appreciate this exchange. Thanks a lot. Our margin of our 200 rubles. So the only one person who lost this money uh, approach, Martina. 